thanks for coming. Uh, you know, thanks Borders for having us, and really, uh, you know, thanks Jeff and David for you know agreeing to be seen with me. Um, <laughs> you know, thanks Jeff for really putting this all together. I mean, this was really you know he did a ton of promotion for you know this reading in, in particular. So you know, very appreciative to be along for the ride. Okay, so uh, I'm just gonna jump into the little sleep, and I'll talk a little bit like where the first chapter came from. Uh, this is my first novel. We'll start with chapter one. It's about two o'clock in the afternoon, early March. In South Boston, that means a cold, hard rain that ruins any memories of the sun. Doesn't matter, because I'm in my office wearing a 20-year-old thrift store wool suit. It's brown, but not in the brown as the new black way. My shoes are dark martins, black like my socks. I'm not neat and clean or shaved. I am sober, but don't feel sober. There's a woman sitting on the opposite side of my desk. I don't remember her coming in, but I know who she is. Jennifer Times, a flavor of the second local celebrity, singing contestant on American Star, daughter of the Suffolk County DA, and she might be older than my suit. Pretty and brunette, lips that are worked out, pumped up. She's tall and her legs go from the north of Maine all the way down to Boston. But she sits like she's small, all compact, a closed book. She wears a white t-shirt and a knee length skirt. She looks too spring for March, not that I care. I wear a fedora, trying too hard to be anachronistic or iconoclastic, not sure which. It's dark in my office, the door is closed, the blinds drawn over the bay window, so much to turn on the light. I say, shouldn't you be in Hollywood? Not that I watch, but the little birdies tell me you're a finalist, and the live competition starts tomorrow night. She says, they sent me home to do a promotional shoot at my mall and at my old high school. Yeah. I like that she talks about her high school, as if it were eons removed instead of mere months. Lucky you. She doesn't smile, everything is serious. She says, I need your help, Mr. Genovich. And she pulls her white gloved hands out of her lap. I say, I don't trust hands that wear gloves. She looks at me like I chose the worst possible words, like I missed the whole point of her story, the story I haven't heard yet. She takes off her right glove and her fingers are individually wrapped in bandages, but it's a bad wrap job, gauze coming undone and sticking out, Christmas presents wrapped in old tissue paper. She says, I need you to find out who has my fingers. I think about opening the shades, maybe some light wouldn't be so bad. I think about clearing my desk of empty soda cans. I think about canceling the Southie lease, too many people double parking in front of my office apartment building. I think about the ever-expanding doomed universe, and all of it makes more sense than what she said. Say that again? Her blue eyes stay fixed on me, like she's the one trying to figure out who's telling the truth. She says, I woke up like this yesterday. Someone stole my fingers and replaced them with these. She holds her hand out to me as if I can take it away from her and inspect it. May I? I gently take her hand and I lift up the bandage on her index finger and find a ring of angry red stitches. She takes her hand back from me quick, like if I hold on to it too long I might decide to keep those replacement digits of hers. Look, Miss Times, circumstantial, uh, circumstantial evidence to the contrary and all that, but I don't think what you described is exactly possible. I point at her hand. I'm telling her that her hand is impossible. Granted, my subscription to Mad Scientist Weekly did run out. <laughs> too many words, not enough pictures. She says, it doesn't matter what you think is possible, Mr. Genovich, because I'll only be paying you to find answers to my questions. Her voice is hard as pavement. I get the sense that she isn't used to people telling her no. I gather the loose papers on my desk, stack them, and then push them over the edge and into the trash can. I want a cigarette, but I don't know where I put my pack. How and why did you find me? I talk slow. Every letter and syllable has to be in its place. Does it matter? She talks quick and to the point. She wants to tell me more tell me everything about everything, but she's holding something back, or maybe she's just impatient with me, like everyone else. I say, I don't do much field work anymore, Miss Times. Early retirement, so early it happened almost before I got the job. See this computer? I turn the flat screen monitor toward her. An infinite network of Escher-esque pipes fill the screensaver pixels. That's what I do, I research. I do genealogies, find abandoned properties, check the status of out-of-state warrants, and find lost addresses. I search databases, and when desperate, which is all the time, I troll Craigslist and eBay and want ads. I'm no action hero. I find stuff in the internet ether. Something tells me your fingers won't be in there. She says, I'll pay you 10,000 just for trying. She places a check on my desk. I assume it's a check. It's green and rectangular. What, no manila envelope bulging with unmarked bills? I'll pay you another 50,000 if you find out who has my fingers. I'm about to say something sharp and clever about her allowance from daddy but I blink my eyes and she is gone. I'm gonna read two brief paragraphs from uh, chapter two to sort of explain just what happened. <laughs> uh, chapter two. 
Right after I come to is always the worst, when the questions about dreams and reality seem fair game, when I don't know which is which. Jennifer Times is gone and my head is full of murk. I try to push the murk to the corners of my consciousness, but it squeezes out and leaks away, mercury in a closed fist. That murk, it's always there. It's both a threat and a promise. I am narcoleptic. How long was I asleep? My office is dark, but it's always dark. I have the sense that a lot of time has passed, or maybe just a little. I have no way of knowing. I generally don't remember to check and set my watch as I'm passing out. Time can't be measured anyway, only guessed at, and my guesses are usually wrong, which doesn't speak well for a guy in my line of work, but I get by. So, um, my detective, Mark Genovich, is he has narcolepsy. Um, now, that first chapter with the missing fingers, when I first had that image, I, I wrote the first chapter and I was going to play it straight. Play it sort of like a Philip K. Dick sort of mix of you know, science fiction and horror that she really has fingers that were replaced and taken away. But I had no idea to fit that chapter, so I put it away for almost a year. And then I was online researching some medical afflictions, which is a pastime. <laughs> I was, for another story, I was doing research and I happened to cross narcolepsy. And all I knew of narcolepsy beforehand was, you know, they get tired, they fall asleep. Uh, I had no idea of the hypnagogic hallucinations. Um, for people who are narcoleptic, when they, when they drop into sleep, they tend to drop directly into a REM state. And they'll have these incredibly vivid dreams, and they'll have a hard time discerning, was that a dream or was that real? So that's something I sort of feature in the novel. He, clearly, that woman was not in his office. When he wakes up on his desk, she's, uh, she's gone. On his desk is an envelope of two photos. So for a large part of the book, Mark is trying to figure out what his case is, never mind to actually solve the case. So, you know, the whole story is really, the main mystery is Mark Janovich. There is a crime and, you know, stuff gets sort of tied together and solved. But it's really about the mystery of the self. You know, the whole time he's wrestling with his own identity, his own past and memories. And really it sort of represents how malleable they all are. Um, 